Anyone here have a deep and abiding love of waiting? Anyone here enjoy that? Nope, not really. We endure it, but it's not something we ever say, I can't wait to wait. What I have found is uh, if I know it will come to an end, if I know it's bounded, right, I can, it's a lot easier. I have w waited in the, in the waiting room, that most infernal and horrible of places, for a loved one to come out of surgery. And you know it can only take so long, so you know it will come to an end. All right, what, what are the things you have waited for that have come to pass? What was the hardest thing you had to wait for? To graduate? Child to be born? Uh, to retire? What, what, what was the worst? Anyone have a one particular thing that they just hated waiting for? They all just kind of blur together. One big hate. I can't wait to be done waiting. But what I have found is if I can put it on the calendar, I can handle it. If I can put it on the calendar, then I can deal with what's in front of me, and I know it's on the calendar, and I'll get to it when, when I get to it. Well, that's the type of waiting we see it in Scripture when, when Moses leads the people out of slavery in Egypt and they go into the, the wilderness. They, they know how long it's going to take them to get to the promised land. It's going to take one generation, 40 years. Now, admittedly, that, that's pretty far down on your calendar. I don't have a calendar that goes 40 years into the future, but at least they knew how long it was going to be. You can, they could get there, right? It's the waiting when you don't know if it's, going to get, it's ever going to happen. That, that's what's worse. That's the waiting that really can grind. The, the waiting that we see in the exiles, when, when the Jewish people go into exile into Babylon, they don't know if they'll ever get to go back to the promised land, back to Israel. That, that's waiting that's hard. That, that's the waiting like the prodigal son, when the prodigal son tells his father off and says, you're dead to me, dad, give me my inheritance. And he goes away, and the father waits for the son to return. The father doesn't know if the son ever will return. That's the waiting that's hard, right? The waiting, when you're waiting for a family member to get their life back on track, or trying to figure out when you can get yours on track. That waiting for the phone call that may or may not ever ring. That type of waiting is the misery because you can't, you can't dwell on it because you'll start to obsess and just get caught up. But you can't forget about it because it's always in the back of your mind. It's always messing with you. It's always messing with you such that your hope for the future is tempted to become despair. That's the situation we find uh, when the book of Hebrews is written. What we read out of first, the book of Hebrews. We read a, a letter that is written to a people. They've been waiting and waiting and hoping and hoping. And, and that waiting and hoping is getting hard. And they're struggling to hold on. And, and this is what they're told. This is the news for those who are tired of waiting. They are told, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not yet seen. We haven't seen tomorrow, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we have faith of the, what, what we're hoping for. That faith is the foundation that we can make it through to tomorrow. The book of Hebrews goes on to give example after example uh, of people who did exactly that. It talks first about Abraham. Abraham, by faith, he took a journey. And I want you to try this one, sometime with your family, because this is what Abraham did. He said to Sarah, God has called us to take a journey. Well, where, where are we going? That way. How long will it take? I'll get back to you. I somehow doubt if you look at your spouse and say that we're going that way for as long as it takes. Do you think they'd get in the car with you? I doubt it. I, my wife wouldn't, and I wouldn't blame her. <laughs> that, that's what Abraham does. He has faith that in tomorrow that God is there and it is going to work out. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, looking for the city which found stations, which was the built by God. And, and it, it, Hebrews then goes into all the people who follow Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and after going through all of these and how they, they went into, the tomor into tomorrow based on faith, it tells us that these, these folk, they died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance. Like a sunrise, like the sun is rising. They can see the sun is coming, but they haven't got there yet. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. They are heading to a country, that, that a better country, that is a heavenly one. They're heading towards something they yearn for, that something that they desire, something that is in their future and they're not there yet. 
What more shall I say, Hebrews continues, time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, these folk who by faith, by their trust in the things they had not yet seen, they conquered kingdoms and performed acts of righteousness and obtained the promises. Therefore, therefore, because we have seen how God has worked in the lives of those before, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, let us lay aside every sin which easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him who endured the cross, despising the shame, and who has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. One of the most powerful ways that Easter matters, one of the most powerful ways that the resurrection changes our lives is it makes it clear that time has a goal. We are headed somewhere. We join with Abraham. We are heading towards a better country, a heavenly city. We're going somewhere we have not yet been but yearn for dearly. And we're not just waiting. To follow Jesus is not to wait on Jesus. It's to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus is to run. We are not people who are wait. That's to stand still. We are people who follow and we follow as fast as we can to be running towards a future in which everything will be made right. Everything that we are waiting for today, for families to be made whole, for friends to be brought back together, for nature to sing, for creation to rejoice. Right? That's what we're headed towards. And if you want to know more about what that looks like, read the last two chapters of Revelation. Read it a few times. Let it sink in. If that's what your life looks like, you have reached the kingdom of God. And if you haven't reached that point yet, we're not done with our race. We're not through yet. We're not there. We haven't followed Jesus long enough. There are many who have come before us. There are many who will follow after us along this path made possible by Jesus. You see, that's what makes running this path possible. The crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus that time has a purpose, first we have to be unshackled from our tomorrows. Anyone here have a tomorrow that you're rather ashamed, or unshackled from our yesterdays? Anyone here have a yesterday that you're kind of ashamed of? Anyone here have a yesterday that you'd rather not ever think about again? A yesterday that has scarred you and damaged you and hurt you? Right? That is the yesterday to which Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That is the forgiveness that Jesus extends. Anything that has happened in your past, Jesus says, forgive them. Forgive us so that we can let go of that yesterday and it does not control our tomorrow. Our tomorrow is not determined by what happened yesterday and we can turn to tomorrow with hope because the thing that we fear most, death, has been conquered. We can run into the future knowing that because of the resurrection, we need not fear tomorrow. We can run into tomorrow knowing that at the end we are seeking the kingdom of God. That's where we're headed. That's our goal. That's where our journey takes us. And if you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like, read a gospel. Read what it looks like when Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up, what happens? The sick are healed. The hungry are fed. Families are reconciled. Friendships are built. Everything is made right and new. That's where we're headed. That's our goal. That, that's, that's our purpose. My friends, I can wait upon the kingdom of God to come in the, whatever tomorrow it comes because I can put it on my calendar. And where does it go on my calendar? It goes on the last page. I, I don't actually have a calendar that goes that far out. I don't even think Google calendars go far, that far out. But on the last day of my calendar is the kingdom of God because that's where I'm headed. And I'm not waiting on it. I'm not someone, you may have noticed this, I'm not someone who waits. I got things to do. And the most important thing I have to do is to run after Jesus. To run this race, to seek to get there as fast as I can. To not grow weary and lose heart, but to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Such that we follow Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The good news that we gather around today is that time itself is redeemed. Each day is not something to endure. We are not people who wait without end. We do not wait as those who are without hope. Time is a race. 
It's a path that we follow, each day taking us one step closer to our Lord and Savior, who forgave our sins and invites us to run after him towards the kingdom of God which is coming. Put as simply as I can say today, the good news of Easter is this. Your yesterdays have no power over you, and your tomorrows are in Jesus' hands. Let's run the race into tomorrow. Amen.